Free will, predestination. Excellent question. Wow. So when you ask me about predestination, free will, what exactly are you asking me about predestination? Are you asking me, has God predestined everything everyone does within yeah. time and space? Yeah. Are you asking me... Salvation. Salvation, okay. So even that, and I'm not trying to skirt the answer because that question needs a little unpacking. Are you asking me, has God predestined those who will be saved? Yes. And when you ask me that, do you really mean God has already chosen before creation who will be saved and who won't? In other words, God has created you yes. to be saved through faith in Christ, but He's created him to hand them over to desires of his heart and then damn him accordingly. Is that what you're asking me? Pretty much. All right. If you read the totality of Scripture, right. God truly desires the salvation of every human creature. Right. You can't get around that. See, these were the things that as a Calvinist I struggled with. Right. I struggled with. I'll give you a couple examples. Right. So we can be here all night talking about this. It's up to you guys. Because this is a very, and I'm treading lightly, not because I don't want to answer, but it's not a yes or no. I have to unpack it. Yeah. I've been spending 50 years trying to figure it out. Brother, we're going to be spending thousands of years still trying to figure it out. <laughs> You're not, believe me, we're not going to figure it out. But I can tell you with absolute certainty on the basis of Scripture, God desires the salvation of even those who end up rejecting Him and going to hell. Right. And from the depth of His being, He desired their salvation. And I'm not saying this because I want to tickle people's ears. That Jesus, remember I said He's the God of truth. He can't lie. Because he can't lie, he's not play-acting. So go to Luke 19, 41 to 44. Notice the heart of Jesus towards Jerusalem that he's now going to allow to be destroyed by the Romans. Notice his heart. Whoever wants to read it. Luke 19, 41 to 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying... He not, wept, huh? Yeah. So now before you move on, you got to read it slowly so it can simmer. Was he play-acting or were these genuine tears from his heart? So here is the human face of God shedding human tears because his heart is broken. But why is his heart broken? Keep reading. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now notice two factors here. First he says, if you only knew what made for your peace. So Jesus came to destroy or to grant them peace? He came to grant them peace. Grant them peace, right? And then 44 he says, but you've left me no choice, and the time is coming. Your enemies will embank, make an embankment around you, dash you and children, to the ground and leave not one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What in the world does that mean? Well, you don't need to guess. Luke has already told you what it means, visitation. Go to Luke 1 and read 67 to 69 and pay attention to verse 68. Luke 1, 67 to 69. What does it mean, the time of your visitation? Luke will explain. This is the beauty of Scripture. The author will explain the things he's written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you don't need to guess. You don't need Sam Shimon's commentary. But if I do write a commentary, I expect every one of you to buy multiple copies. Yeah. <laughs> now, Luke 1, 67 to 69. Whoever's there, please read. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. So understand this is the utterance from the Holy Spirit, right? That's why I had you start at 67. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit, so it's the Holy Spirit who's moving him to utter these words. These are the words the Holy Spirit is moving Zechariah to utter. It's not his fallible, imperfect opinion. Okay, just keep that in mind. Keep reading. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So why did the Lord God visit his people? To do what? Destroy them or redeem them? To redeem them. So when Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation, what is he referring to? That I am the Lord God who has come to visit you to save you. See the connection? So what was Jesus' desire? To save Jerusalem and all her inhabitants. But because you rejected me, now you've left me no choice but allow you to be destroyed. This is why the wording is important. So what is the time of visitation, Jesus? That God has come to visit His people with salvation, not destruction. 
So why did you end up destroying them? Because they refused to accept me. So it wasn't your will to destroy them. No, my will was to save every one of them. So why did they end up destroying Because they rejected me. You see where I'm going with this? So free will. We'll get there. So far. Yes. Anyway, now, that was 168, but now go to 169. Read in your translation. Continue 169. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Horn is a metaphor in the Bible referring to a king with sovereign power. He's raised up a king from whose house? David. To do what? Salvation. Who is that king from the house of David that's come to save? Jesus. Correct. That's why I go to read Luke 2.11 to see it's Jesus. Luke 2, 11. Who is the horn, the king from the house of David that comes to save, not destroy? Comes to save, not condemn. Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So God sent His Son to be born of the seed of David to destroy Jerusalem or to save it? Save salvation. You see why Jesus was crying now? Do you see His heart? He started weeping because I had come to save you but because you didn't recognize who I am but oppose me you leave me no choice but give you what you deserve so this is the heart of God this is God's heart for even those who are destroyed his heart was I didn't come to destroy you, I came to save you so the Lord did everything in his power and goodness to convince them they persisted in their rebellion leaving him no choice but to hand them over justifiably so to destruction but to make it even more plainer, that he came to save them. That was his desire. Same chapter, Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 77. Read what it says there. Now, Zechariah is prophesying over his son, John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist is born, the forerunner of Jesus. So now he's going to prophesy over his son, John. You, John, my son, you were created for this purpose. For what purpose? Read a new child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give acknowledge of salvation to his people, and the forgiveness of their sins. So what is he going to tell the people? The Savior has come, and he's come to save you from your sins by believing in him. And who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. So it's quite clear in the context of Luke, the intention and the purpose of Jesus was to save Jerusalem as a whole. Everyone, even those that end up getting destroyed. Now let me shock you a little further. Jesus also came to save Judas. You who follow me will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Does that include Judas? Okay. But Jesus knew Judas would betray him, and Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas would be destroyed. However, though Jesus knew it, Jesus is showing his intention and his heart. My heart for you, Judas, is salvation, not destruction. And I have all this in store for you, if you only believe. Let me give you a couple more. Go to Matthew 10, verses 1, all the way to 8. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. I want you to see, not only was Judas promised a throne, Judas was given the same power to do the same miracles that the others did. Judas, like the rest, raised the dead. Judas, like the rest, gave sight to the blind. Judas, like the rest, cast out demons. Judas, like the rest, preached the gospel and got people saved. It's right there, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. You'll see it. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Eleven of disciples? No, all twelve. Judas too? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Keep going to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So even Judas, huh? Yeah. And so what did Judas do? Keep reading, all the way to eight. These twelve... These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the What is Judas going to do? Heal what? Heal the sick, raise the dead. So Judas was going to raise the dead. Yeah. 
Someone whom the Lord knew would betray him will belong to the devil. Keep reading. Cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without paying. Mm. So, Judas was given the same authority to do the same miracles and was given the same promise to reign over Israel that the rest were, right? It's going to get a little better or worse depending on your theological belief. Go to Luke 10, 17 to 20. Jesus. 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your Now, name. does that include Judas or no? That would include Judas, right? All right, keep going. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and, on all, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay, whose names are written in heaven? Whose names are written in heaven? Well, the, 72? the 72 that went out. Okay. Judas went out, went out too? Yes, sir. So his name is written in heaven? I never thought of it. Exactly. I mean, and I say that because clearly Jesus is showing his intention for Judas. You will sit on one of the twelve thrones. I've given you power over demons. They are subject to you, and your name is written in heaven. See, in the Bible, names are erased. In other words, if you read the Bible contextually, which I'm about to do, every human creature that exists, his name is written. It's when a person falls away that the names are erased. Go to Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book. That's a promise to who? The one who conquers, right? So if you conquer, not only will you be given a right role, but I won't blot out your name. Right. Therefore, if you fail to conquer, what happens? You don't need to guess. Go to Exodus 32, 32 to 33, where God makes it explicit. Exodus 32, 32 to 33. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which yeah. thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So you caught it? He blots out those who sin and turn away. So if I read contextually, Judas' name is in the book. Judas is one of those who will sit on one of the twelve thrones. And Judas is given power to cast out demons, raise the dead, all of which displays Jesus' genuine love for Judas. But it's going to get even more explicit in Luke 22, 19 and 23. Luke 22, 19 and 23. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, before you move on, does he exclude anyone in what he just said? No. This bread is my body broken for you. Does he say some of you, most of you, but not all of you? All and then in verse 20, one more time. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Some of you, most of you, but not all of you? Not all of you. But now notice who's included. Now read 21 to 23. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth. As it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So when Jesus said, this bread represents my body broken for all of you, and this cup is the new cup of my blood shed for you, was Judas there? Of course not. And he included Judas in that saying? So Jesus saying to Judas, I'm even dying for you, and this is how you repay me. Now one more final passage on this. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. So there you go. It's blotting out those whose names are in. And why are they being blotted out? Why are the names being blotted out? They're not considered. Because of their persistent rebellion and rejecting the truth, right? So why did I bring up Judas? Because Judas represents Jesus' heart for all of Jerusalem. And not just for all of Jerusalem, but all creation. That God's desire is to save every creature that he's created. 
and God has done everything to show his love for every creature. But when someone persists in rebellion and turns away, then God is justified in handing him over to destruction. John 3, 5, after Nicodemus is baffled, when Jesus says, you must be born again, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, in verse 5, what does it say? Who wants to read it? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This will be a test of whether you eisegete or you exegete. What does it mean, water and spirit? Now, I can give you the interpretations given historically. Here, water means the water of the word. Then when you hear the word, it cleanses you. And some will go to John 15, verse 3. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Or in Ephesians 5, 26. The washing of the water of the word. Ephesians 5, 26. Okay, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that it's referring to natural birth, the water of the womb. Why? Because in verse 4, what does he say? Must I enter my mother's womb a second time? So he understood it to mean natural birth. But then in verse 6, Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? So, oh, see, natural birth. Okay, that's the second meaning. The third meaning is that when it says water and spirit, that word and gets a little tricky in the Greek. And get any commentary to confirm this. The word an doesn't always mean an. It can mean even. The water, even the spirit, meaning the water, that is the spirit. So that water here means the spirit. It's simply two ways of speaking of being born of the spirit. Now where do they get that from? Because in John 7, 38 to 39, in John 7, 38 to 39, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then 39, John says, of this he spake of the Spirit. So you see, water, that is the Spirit. Now there's a fourth interpretation. Water, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the four interpretations. Contextually, what interpretation makes sense of the context historically? If you tell me water here means being cleansed by the word you'd have to show me nicodemus understood it because jesus is trying to make it clear to nicodemus you must be born again don't pass it off on god's omniscience because jesus is trying to tell him this is what you must do to then not explain how to do it means he's left in the dark about how to be born again so would he have understood it to mean the water of the word how jesus never mentioned anything about the word cleansing you right Okay, the strongest, the se I would say the second strong is natural birth. Why? Because before and after he talks about birth, right? right. Okay, but I'm going to show you one that's even stronger. John 3, 5, early church fathers. You will find from the epistle of Barnabas to Irenaeus to Justin Martyr and on and on it goes. Every one of them, when they spoke about John 3, 5, they understood water to mean water baptism without exception. I'm going to tell you why that's important in a minute. I'll tell you that why it's important in a minute. But let's go contextually. How many of you are aware that Jesus used to baptize people in water before his death and resurrection? How many of you are aware that Jesus actually had his disciples immerse people in water, in a body of water? Where do we find that? Right here, right after he finishes telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. Because notice in verse 22, after he finishes the conversation, what does Jesus do? Chapter 7 or 8? No, John 3, 22. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, after. Right after he says, you must be born of water and spirit, the only gospel writer to mention, Jesus started baptizing people in water. Coincidence? John 3, 22. Someone read it for me. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he carried with them and baptized he baptized, huh? And just so you don't have any doubt it's water, they go to John the Baptist. If you continue reading, they go to John. Hey, the man that you're talking about, everyone's going to him to be baptized. And that's when John says, well, I'm just a friend. He is the bridegroom. He must increase. I must decrease. And then if you still don't get that Jesus is baptizing people. Read 26. 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to him thou bearest witness. Behold, the same baptizeth. And all men come to him. And if they're talking to John who's baptizing in water, guess what kind of baptism Jesus is doing? In water. Water baptism. And if you still don't get it, John 4, verses 1 to 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Through the agency of the disciples. So, 
Is it a coincidence after telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit, he starts baptizing people in water through the agency of his disciples? Or is John, the author, wants you to make a connection and see Jesus' meaning? I agree with you, but I've heard people say, well, what about the thief that was on the cross, on the cross and he says, today sure. you will be with me in paradise. I actually did a session because... Let's think logically. Do you really expect someone who's got spikes in his hands to then someone say, Hey, get him off right now and dip him in water, dude, or he's not going to heaven? That is one of the worst examples here because Jesus Christ, who's God, can grant anyone salvation any manner he, he sees fit. You're talking about an exceptional case. Someone who not only didn't get baptized, who didn't even go to church, who didn't study the Bible, who didn't take communion. So is he the norm? Is that the person we look to as the normal way of doing things? Or is that an exception to show you that the grace of God is so vast that he can even save you in the last seconds of your life? But ask me a better question. What if that man survived? Would he have then been obligated to get baptized? Based on what you're showing us, yes. It has to be, because what did the Lord say? The Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why I said John 3, 5 will be a test study of whether you exegete or you eisegete. But someone had their hand raised? Yeah, I, so so uh, Matthew 7, 21. Uh, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, yes. shall I enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father is in heaven. Yes, precisely. He was referring to Judas one as one. Yes, because Judas yes. did miracles. Right. Judas cast out demons, right? right? He did everything right. Jesus said those people would do. But one thing Judas did not do, he did not obey the commands of the Lord. I can be preaching all day, all night. But if I'm not striving to live in obedience to the will of God, then I am a Judas. Mm. Because Jesus tells you how you know a true Christian from a false one. It's right there in Matthew 7, 23. I will tell them plainly, <clears throat> I never knew you. Depart from me. You lawless ones. Now the word is interesting. It's anomian. It means without law. A negation nomos. Meaning you who rejected my law. See, we don't emphasize enough in the church. And we don't. And I, I'm not attacking. I'm just being honest. The necessity to obedience to God's law. Amen. People will tell you, well, Moses gave the law. Jesus gave grace. You know, I'm saved by grace, not by law. Well, that confuses two issues. They weren't saved by law either. In the Old Testament, no one was saved by the law. They were saved by grace. And in the New Testament, though you're saved by grace, you're saved unto obedience to the law of Christ. You have a law that you're supposed to obey. It's called the law of Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians 9, 21. So I didn't mean to go a far drift. I didn't do it justice to the answer about predestination. But I did want to emphasize, however, whatever... If you have predestination, you cannot deny God's heart that He wants to save every creature in existence. But the will of the Father is that everyone would know Him. Therefore, it's yes. responsibility according to His law yes. to go out and tell everyone. Yes, you him. have to. Yeah. I'll prove that to you, that God's will, because you can't have Jesus' will in conflict with the Father's will, mm -hmm. or conflict with the Spirit. Then you don't have a trinity. You have three separate gods in conflict. The Father's will is in perfect union with the Son's will and the Spirit's will. That's why, if you remember what he said about the Spirit, let me remind you what he said about the Spirit. He will not speak on his own initiative. He will only speak what he hears. That was John 16, 13. The members of the Godhead are in perfect, inseparable union. They always do all things in perfect union. They're never in competition or opposition. So if it's Jesus' will for Judas to be saved, guess whose will that was as well? The Father, the Father and the Spirit. Unless there's a conflict of will within the Godhead. Well, then you destroy the integrity of the Godhead. And I don't think anyone wants to go that far. But let's just read 1 Corinthians 9, 21. 21. What read? To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So we do have a law. It's called the law of Christ. And that's in Galatians 6, verse 2, by the way. Galatians 6, verse 2. So you Christians have been saved to obedience to the law of Christ. Well, what is that law? That's why I have 27 books of instruction. Galatians 6, verse 2. Hmm. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So Christians, grace doesn't exclude or do away with the law. 
Grace results in the empowerment to obey the law. The law of Christ. And if you ask me what it is, that's why you have 27 books of instruction. That's the law of Christ. So what's the criterion that Jesus gives there to know a true Christian or a false one? Are you obeying the law? What law? Not the Mosaic law, the law of Christ and its fulfillment of the Mosaic law. Right? No, I'm, I'm just giving you scripture. Right? Are you saying it? So that's the criterion. But now, as far as predestination, and I don't want to keep belaboring it because I want to give people opportunity. Uh, because again, I can be here all day on predestination. This is why I'm trying to know how much to say in a way that will put you on a journey to think more deeply about the, about, about the subject. It, it, you see irrefutable proof God wants every creature to be saved. Now, I'm going to show you a passage. I actually debated a colleague of mine, Matt Slick. He's a five-point Calvinist. I love him. He's a dear brother in the Lord. We debate on limited atonements online. But if you think that this man is a brother in the Lord, I disagree with him, but I'm not going to vilify him in order to make him look as evil as possible in order for you not to get to hear what he has to say because that's truly of the devil that's what the devil does someone who's a believer and uh, someone else that you recognize as a believer you hear him out that's why i kept telling the brothers listen more than you speak because let me make my point let me finish before i finish listen see when i want to hear another position i listen i don't i start listen and i hear I process it, then I have questions. Okay, well, hold on, you said this. Well, what about this? Colossians 1, 13 and 17. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Pause for a second, my brother. Would anyone deny when it says, by Christ, all things were created in heaven and earth? That means every creature? Keep reading. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things are. Together. Okay, now, clear as day, all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation, no one is excluded, right? Even spiritual powers, because it has dominions, principalities, authorities, right? All right. Now, notice the second part, 18 to 20. And he is the head uh, of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. That is, in everything, he might be preeminent. Okay. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the oh. blood of the cross. Uh oh. Did the light switch go on for anyone? Verse 20. Jesus made peace by the blood of the cross for who? All things. All things. All things, all things where? And where? And on earth and where? Yeah. But that's parallel to 16, right? All things that he created in heaven and earth, he's now procured the redemption of everything he created in heaven and earth. I understand where you're going. Where does repentance, if universalism is where a person's theology is, yes. then there's really no need for repentance. Well, they're saying and those... for that matter, yeah, obedience. Yeah, that's not their position. Their position is if you've died rejecting Christ, that's why you will go to hell. Because that's where you will be punished for your repentance. But the purpose is not to wipe you out or to prolong your judgment. It's to purge you and purify you of your evil so that now you enter heaven and are grateful for what Jesus did. So they say that's what hell is there for, for the person who refused to turn to Christ. Right? So again, I'm not making a case for universalism. I'm not a universalist. But what I'm saying is, the first to present his case seems right until and his neighbor comes and questions him. You've heard criticisms of their view, but have you ever sat and listened to someone make a case for their view and then decided whether they're wrong? Right. You see the point? Yes. Let me give you another verse that goes with this. And don't lose your place in Colossians. Keep it there, because we didn't finish Colossians. Yeah. But 
Proverbs 18.13 is another passage we need to put take to heart. Someone read that for me. He that answereth an a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So when you rush to judgment to answer before hearing it out thoroughly, what did the text say? You're being, and I'm not saying you, you. You're being right. stupid and foolish. Fool and sure. yeah. Right? So you see, this is wisdom from God. Don't rush to judge. Don't speak before you've heard something thoroughly. And don't settle for the first opinion, because the first to present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. That was the same chapter, verse 17. So by now, coming back to Colossians 1. Let's go back to Colossians 1. Got it. Now, let's read 16 and 17 again. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold. Now read verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So if in verse 16, all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation without exception. So did Jesus create everything in heaven and on earth without exception? Correct. Mm -hmm. But then, how do you then avoid the implication of verse 20? He also procured the redemption of all things on earth and in heaven. Who's exempted from the work of his redemption? Nobody? Well, those are rejected. Yes, but not, not talking about its application. Okay, all right. Redemption accomplished is not the same thing as redemption applied. Right. You know what I'm saying? When he accomplished redemption, who did he accomplish it for? Everybody. Everyone, right? Yes. So then how can limited atonement be true? That he only died for the elect. Good point. Right? Now, how did I get vilified in the debate to make me look bad? Let me tell you. You can watch the debate. Oh, so you're saying he died for Satan. I said, Matt. Number one, if it means everything, it means everything. So if it means Satan, yes, but Satan will not be saved because he won't believe, because there's a condition. You must believe to receive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he, the Calvinists had a field day. Oh, Sam Shimon says Satan's going to be saved. No, that's what they said. And that's not what I said. I said, Matt, the text exegetically, if all things in heaven and earth, you have no problem admitting Jesus created it, then deal with the parallel. All things on earth and in heaven, he has redeemed and made peace with the blood of his cross. So then Satan will be saved. No, because accomplishing redemption is not the same thing as applying it because there's a condition you must believe to receive. He made it available to all. You got it. This is the problem I was having as a Calvinist. I had to explain away a lot of passages. So quite clearly to answer the sister's question, there is no doubt that everyone that God created, he desires their salvation. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Now, how does predestination work? That's a topic that would require me. I can go into it, but it requires more than a two-minute soundbite, right? Because then you have to talk about what is actually being predestined, who is being predestined, and what's the relationship with free will, human responsibility. And in Christianity, you have various attempts of harmonizing it. It's not just the Calvinist understanding. God has predestined everything. If you actually force a Calvinist against the corner and say, do you acknowledge God predestined even the rape of a child? They have to say yes. They will tell you yes because God has a purpose. So when Judas, let's say, betrayed Jesus, he did it freely because as a sinner, his sinful heart desired to betray Jesus and God didn't compel him. But could have Judas chosen otherwise? No, he couldn't. And could God have stopped Judas? Yes, he could. Because in the Bible, you find God stopping people from carrying out specific sins. I'll give you one example. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abraham was too afraid to say, Sarah is my wife. So she, she said, she's my sister. And by the way, she was his sister. Did you guys know that? She was his sister. You guys looking at me like you're angry. Please forgive me. But you guys know that? Sarah was his sister. He says it. You know where he says it? 
If you go to Genesis 20, 12, he says, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father. Mm -hmm. Different mother. Yeah, yeah, she is my sister. <laughs> Same dad, different mom. I didn't lie to you. So technically, I was speaking the truth. She's my wife. Right? Genesis 20, verse 12. We got the same daddy, not the same mommy. So I didn't lie to you. Yeah, but you forgot the extra detail. She's not just your sister, she's your wife. Oops. But then just to tell you, he, and here's a man called the father of the faithful, how cowardly he was. In that same Genesis 20, if you read verse 13, he says, I made a covenant with her. If I find favor in your sight, don't tell people you're my wife because you're beautiful and they'll kill me. Tell them you're my sister. She agreed to it. I don't know if that sunk in, ladies. Sarai, who later became Sarah, was willing to be violated by men to save her husband's life. And her husband was willing to allow his wife to be ravished to protect his wife, to protect his life. Who showed greater faith and love there? Sarah or Abraham? Sarah. Sarah. I love you so much, I'm willing to be ravished by another man to spare your life, but you don't love me enough to fight for me and die for me. Mm. How many women would stick around with a man like that today? Right? And she did. So we often forget the faithfulness of Sarah. Why God loved her. See, it moves me sometimes. Some of these stories move me in my spirit. Why God loved her and said, she will be the mother of the child of the covenant. Because she's a great woman, Abraham. It's amazing. God is good. Anyway, when Abimelech took uh, Sarah, and right before he sleeps with her, he has a dream. It's Genesis 20, I'm not making up verses 1 to 6. You're as good as a dead man. You're as good as a dead man. Because you've taken another man's wife. And he said, will you punish my people and my innocence? Did he not tell me this is his wife? He goes, I know. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. So God stopped him. What's the point? Calvinist who's consistent has to say, yes, Judas' betrayal, that rape was predestined. God didn't make the person do it, but God did predestine it so that even though the person did it freely, he couldn't have, he couldn't have chosen contrarily. So that's one view of reconciling God's knowledge and human responsibility. There's another view. It's called middle knowledge, Molinism. One of its greatest defenders is William Lane Craig. Yeah. One of his greatest. Middle knowledge, basically, and Alex will correct me here if I'm, if I'm mistaken. God knows all possible universes. Yeah. He knows how every person will react in a given universe. So if I put you in situation A, this is how you react. If I put you in situation B, this is how you react. So God knew that this world is the only possible world where he could get the maximum number of people to be saved freely because of the circumstances that this universe would, would we'd, we'd uh, find ourselves in. I'm trying to articulate it clearly. So this view says God knows all things and he knows that if I want the most number of people to be saved, this is the only world I can create. Because there is no possible world will everyone freely believe. So the only world I can create where I can get the most number of people to freely be saved is this one. And that's why God created it. So that's another view. But there's a third view that many people don't like. It's called open theism. The champion of this view's name is Gregory Boyd. This view says God is infinitely wise, infinitely intelligent, and knows every possible choice anyone can make given the situation he or she finds himself or herself in. But the future does not exist. There is no future. It doesn't exist. So when this open theist will ask you the question, when you say God knows the future, how? It doesn't exist. So either he created it, but if you say he created it, that means he also created everything that will take place in the future, so you end up being a Calvinist. Right? So how do you escape that the future... And the future decisions of free will creatures are not determined by God. If you say, he knows the future because he created it. That means if he created the future, he created everyone in it and what they'll do. You're now a Calvinist. Foreknowledge so, does not make you... What does foreknowledge mean? Now, I'm just telling you how I'm playing angelic advocate. <laughs> what does uh, foreknowledge mean? It means you're God. Okay, well, what does it mean for God to have foreknowledge? There's something before it happens. 
he had time and space means he, he, he can go anywhere, which direction he wants. A time that doesn't exist or that he created it? It hasn't existed yet. Okay, so then what's, them, what's, what's there for him to foreknow when it doesn't exist? I'll, when I get there, I'll let you Exactly know. the point. That's a very good answer as well. You can say, I don't know how God knows it, but that's my response. And there's no shame in saying that. You know why? Let me tell you why. What your answer was very biblical and respectful. Because there are things about God we won't know. So you can tell some legitimacy. I don't know how he knows the future. He knows it without having to create it and everything in it. How? I don't know, and I'm good with that answer. Because the Bible says, God's ways are not my ways, His thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is God's ways and thoughts. So I may not know, but it doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. Excellent answer. Yeah. 